welcome to the opening night of the 2014 Baltimore Economic Democracy Conference, Building Our New Economy Together. This is a very exciting space. It's a very exciting time, and I appreciate all of you coming here tonight. My name is Margaret Flowers, and I'm the co-director of It's Our Economy. Our website is itsoureconomy.us. And the mission of It's Our Economy is to educate people about this new economy that's, that's growing up. Um, one of our speakers who can't be here tonight, Gar Alperovitz, um, there was a, a train accident tonight and he wasn't able to make it up, um, often says that in feudalism there was a market and that market grew up and became capitalism. And right now in capitalism we have this new economy that's growing up. That's, some people call it a democratized economy or a solidarity economy. And we're hoping that that will grow up and replace the, the capitalist model and be one that's more just and sustainable. Um, it's Our Economy is a project of popularresistance.org. And the goal of popular resistance is to help people see that all of our struggles are connected, that the fight for health care, for the environment, for jobs, for a free and open internet, um, are all tied to one part, are all part of one broader, bigger movement for social, economic, and environmental justice. And that when we work together, when we see these connections and work together, we're much stronger and we can get more things done. So tonight begins uh, the first conference, uh, Baltimore Economic Democracy Conference. And what we're trying to do is bring a bigger vision of a new kind of economy to Baltimore. What would that look like if there was an economy that actually put the needs of people and protection of the planet before corporate profits. Um, and this economy is actually, it's growing around the world. It has been for some time, um, but it's come to the United States. And in Baltimore, the seeds of this new economy are already growing. And so what was exciting when we started talking to some of the groups that were working on different pieces or that were interested in them, um, there was energy to kind of come together and see that actually we're part of a broader vision of changing the whole kind of culture of Baltimore to be one that really supports its people and reflects the, the people that are here. Um, and so uh, tomorrow we're going to have um, our conference, our working kind of conference. Tonight the goal is really to bring together this bigger picture and to have this really be a town hall type of event. Um, we're each going to speak, but then we really hope to be able to devote quite a lot of time to your questions and so don't be intimidated, just you know, speak up. Um, tomorrow is really when the work <coughs> begins, and that will be at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, and we'll have five tracks going on there. So one will be on cooperatives, another will be on different ways of thinking about finance and money, another one will be on community land trusts, which is a way to make housing sustainably affordable. Um, we'll also talk about renewable energy and food, how we develop food security in the city of Baltimore. Um, this is a our goal is not to just have this be a one-time thing, but that tomorrow at the end of that conference, we're really going to come together and identify our next steps and how do we keep this economy growing and building in Baltimore. I want to give a quick shout out to Christopher White in the back with the white shirt. He's our <laughs> national coordinator. <laughs> And uh, so really, if this economy is going to happen, it's going to depend on all of us making it happen. Um, it, it's, it's something that needs to be determined by the people who live there, ourselves, in a democratic fashion, what we want our city to look like. And so if you get involved in this, I'm sure you'll be hearing from Chris. And then next to Chris is Kevin Thies, who's the other co-director of It's Our Economy. Um, tonight we have, we were going to have four speakers, as I said, Gar Alperovitz, who was the co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, um, was not able to make it. But we do have an interview that Paul Jay did with him, so we're going to show that. Um, we also have Diane Bell McCoy. She's the president and CEO of Associated Black Charities. We have um, Jackie Dunn on the end, and she's the co-author of Rethinking Money. <coughs> I can never t remember this. How New Currencies Turn Scarcity into Prosperity. And there are copies of this available outside uh, for sale. And then Michael Coleman, who's a leader with the United Workers will also be speaking tonight. So if we can go ahead and start, Diane, with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I will tell you as I began that I'm a tether to the mic, and so <laughs> I would normally do this standing up. So please bear with me, though, as I begin. 
He looked at the Baltimore sky with hopeful eyes, freed from the confining box of America's lies, that black men and women are problems which wish to be harshly dealt, that they have the same opportunities as everyone else. But he no longer viewed himself through the poison of American eyes, no longer defined himself through, Americans, through the prisons of America's lies. As a black man, he knew he had to help himself, that he was an asset to his family, his community, himself. He has a stronger future now, although racialized barriers remain. More in the middle makes this happen here and everywhere in economic justice name. That is what this is about for me. Um, First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity and thank each one of you for being here and being a part of this effort this evening. I think that this is absolutely an essential conversation that must be had not just here in Baltimore, but in many rooms in many cities across this country. But I would tell you that to have this conversation, to really be serious about what we begin to talk about here and in many places is that we have to understand the intersection of this conversation with this country and this globe's growing majority, people of color. And for Baltimore, that majority, and thus the Lynchman population, necessary to achieve the kind of economic democracy is, or in our African Americans. But the framework, I would tell you, for this conversation to have real meaning in this city or anywhere else the framework must be firmly rooted in understanding, acknowledging, and challenging the role of institutional and structural racism. In addition, white privilege cannot be viewed as a taboo subject, but incorporated into how it limits the lens of those seeking economic democracy. And just to lay the groundwork for those that may not be from Baltimore or haven't heard the numbers recently, Baltimore is a majority African-American city. 64% are black, 31% white, 4.4% Hispanic. 53% of Baltimore's households have low income, where in contrast, the metropolitan areas have 40.8% middle class households. Baltimore's black middle income households are more likely to be families headed by women. 34.8% versus headed by married couples, 28.7%. Baltimore's middle income population is not college educated, professional middle class at all. Less than 9.2% of adults 25 and older living in a black middle income household have a BA degree. And only 2.9% have advanced degrees. Significant rates of high school incompletion and almost 20% only have some college experience. So by all economic indicators, African Americans are at the bottom. Limited home ownership equity and limited home ownership, limited market financial investments, and limited number of black owned businesses with seven or more employees. But this is also despite knowing that the data both national and locally that African-American owned businesses will give an opportunity for a lesser educated African-American. And so now if you listen to this data and you may think lots of negative thoughts as people often do, and one could hear the data and think no assets. But I would challenge you and I would tell you that when we look at the data we're clear that you have to frame it against the impact of institutional and structural racism in this country. It's kind of the last frame that our country has struggled to challenge, to even have open conversations about. But the impact on individuals and the impact on opportunities and access. Then the story changes. Then how you view those numbers change. The focus changes and we actually, I believe, and we believe from research, you really get closer to the root causes and indeed can seek for real transformative change in Baltimore versus what I believe we've done so many years is limited transactional change where only a few benefit. 
So for the sake of this evening, I want to give you just a few examples about the impact of institutional and structural racism as I talked about those black men and women and children in this city. Black men drop out unemployed, unemployed. Black men in completion of higher education. Black businesses limited in numbers and even more limited in having robust employment numbers. On the transactional level, what does the impact of institutional and structural racism have on people living in low-income communities where the police determine it's okay to treat everyone the same? Everyone is often viewed as a criminal. Where your rights are deemed disposable. What is the message in that community that is repeatedly given to a black man? Let's talk about education and the education of children, especially low-income and children of color. Who teaches them? Do you know that the majority of schools of education in this country do not teach teachers how to teach? And no offense to any teachers in the room. But we know empirically from national data from every state in this country that even though we actually know how to teach children how to read, it's actually proven methods it's not taught in most higher education institutions. Even though we know classroom management, it's not taught often in higher education institutions. And who does a less experienced teacher come to? Where do they come? Okay. Let's talk about the growth of African American businesses and how do businesses generally grow and make deals. Let's go beyond the issue of capital. And even as we grow cooperatives, I would say that it's important that the business management arm of that cooperative consists of knowledgeable people of color if the employee and owners are people of color. What is the message when it's not? But let's go up the educational ladder and let's talk about higher education and access to information and relationships to give you an on-ramp for economic security. Do you know in the state of Maryland, where you may find information about the state scholarships and grants for higher education, it is only available online. Okay, for us, this is called more in the middle. It's about transactional and addressing the impact of institutional and structural racism. But it's also equally important about challenging and educating and organizing and galvanizing white, brown, black people to understand how these racialized barriers, policies and systems limit our collective future. They limit collectively all of us, what we pay to treat people of color and low income as negatives. So what does it say if we in fact change and begin to address those institutional and structural racialized policies that contribute to these outcomes. I would tell you that, relatively speaking, only a few years ago, when the environmental agenda for this country was really just sought after by a very few group of people. Think back, we all remember that. And it was kind of the advocates, the policy wants, the populist everyday citizens, most of us probably question the need for a sustainable agenda. And very few people who were struggling economically saw relevance to their lives. We really weren't convinced that changing our behavior today was necessary to protect our resources for tomorrow. Well, we all know that we have proof. We now have proof that we're not only borrowing from our planet's future by our behavior today, but we were, in fact, then gambling on our future. I would tell you that is true for institutional structural racism. That unless we confront it, unless we address and look for it, unless we deal with the issue of white privilege and recognize that it's not a negative, it's not an individual conversation, it's not about somebody being bad or good, it just is. And that addressing those issues, in fact, will begin us moving toward really economic democracy. For us, it's really understanding 
So that means changing and looking at those differences in terms of whether it's employment, whether it's cooperative, whether it's in terms of using public policy and using major government as well as our anchor institutions to change how they do business in terms of what does it say in a city that's largely African American that has less than 74 African American businesses with five or more employees. What does that say? So those are the factors for us that become very important in addressing. But we're not ridiculous enough to believe it's an agenda that Associated Black Charities can address alone. We're very clear that we will actually produce grant touch strategies, whether it's helping people become prepared to sit on boards, people of color, to know, to deal with the isms so they don't walk away. Whether it's also reaching out and paying attention to helping people have an on-ramp to opportunity in terms of real training that's focused on a job and a career. Whether it's helping people understand what they don't know they don't know. Because in fact, if you've never had the opportunity and no one in your family has, tell me where do you think you get that if you live in one of these communities? And if you get it in America where there is white privilege that dominates the conversation. So those are the issues that we deal with, both from a service standpoint, transactional, but also from a public policy. Whether it's a public policy around higher education, whether it's a policy around whether or not it's moving forward in terms of the city policies. Also, we know, again, as I said, we don't do it alone. And so I'm very pleased to say it means we've got other partners. That it's about how do we change the lens of other organizations? How do we have other larger nonprofits, even the corporate civic sector, citizens themselves, understand how it impacts our lives? How do we help other organizations recognize their white privilege and recognize how they're contributing to the demise of the economy for people of color in this city? And we're pleased we are moving forward in that direction. We believe it's a tool that can be used in any city in this country where the linchpin population are people of color. It may not be African Americans, it may be Hispanic. But unless we deal with the reality that's very possible, very real for people of color in their everyday lives, but it's not talked about on top of the table, but it's a part of how people go about from an economic security. None of this conversation will matter, I will tell you, unless we address it on top of the table. Thank you. So the um, next piece is going to be um, a short video of an interview with Gar Alperovitz that Jay, Paul Jay did in a series called Reality Asserts Itself. Um, and he did a series of five videos with, with Gar. Um, and what Gar is going to talk about is kind of, and what we had hoped he was going to talk about if he was here, is kind of this moment that we live in right now. I mean, we're facing so many crises, um, but there are solutions to these crises, and it's an opportunity when we're faced with a crisis to look at what the root causes of that crisis are, how do we address them, but also to realize that we don't have to continue to operate within the current construct that we can change that construct and build these alternative systems that will work better and produce more desirable results. So um, this segment is a little bit of a downer, but then we're going to get into some more positive <laughs> things. So if we could please Reality pull, asserts um, itself with Gar Alpovitz. Now we get sort of to the meat of where we're headed in the interview series with Gar. And Gar now joins us again in the studio. Once again, Gar is the Lionel R. Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland and co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative, and his most recent book is What Then Must We Do? Straight Talk About the Next American Revolution. Thanks for joining us again. So before we get into what next shall we do, let's just get a lie of the land of the current situation. Um, the traditional theory of, of capitalist economies is you go through a business cycle, there's ups, there's downs. If you're rich enough, you'll make money up and down. If you're rich and stupid, maybe you'll lose some, but if you're good at it, you, you probably won't. 
Um, it, when the economy is down, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people have had their lives destroyed. Sometimes the business cycle is, 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 is talked about like it's some antiseptic thing or just a formula. You know, the millions of people who lose their homes and lose their jobs and whose families are destroyed. That's also part of the normal business cycle. But a lot of people are saying that we're no longer in a normal business cycle, that we've reached a point of uh, long-term stagnation, even if there might be little ups and downs. And increasingly, many more people will have their lives destroyed by all of this. So let's start with, before we talk about what a new economy would look like, why would you think the economy av as we have won't just kind of come back and, and life will be okay again for most people? Well, there, there's lots of reasons why the economy is in trouble. I mean, the most obvious one is that when you concentrate all the income at the top, people don't buy, they can't buy enough. They can invest it or they can put it under the, <laughs> under the mattress or they can put it in stock speculation but they've got a house, they've got two houses, three cars, they can't purchase enough Keynesian ideas to stimulate the economy. Uh, so that's the same, you have this in Marxist theory in another way. By and large, if you concentrate it all at the top, there's not enough purchasing power to make the rest of the system work. So what happens is you throw people out of work and you have an economy within a large population, large numbers of whom are out of work. So I think that's the central phenomena that's gone on concentration of income and wealth at the top and no way to reallocate it for purchasing power. The second thing that's gone on, to really answer your question, uh, that has typically led at some point to a big crisis, a big Great Depression style, style crisis. But the oddity of the modern era now is that, you know, in 1929, before the Depression, government was 11% of the economy. That's the floor. It's now about 32%. So the floor is at a very different level. You can go down, but you've got a buffer that brings it back. You've also got some Keynesian policies. When, when, when trouble really hits, the corporations go to the government and say, spend money, some money. So it keeps it within a certain frame. And the language that some economists are now using, and they never used before because it was too left wing, it is, this is secular stagnation. As, a, as opposed to cyclical. As opposed to cyclical, well, it's always going to come back and boom again. No, it's going to be decay and secular. I call it stalemate, st political stalemate, stagnation, and decay. And that's the very different model of where we are and where we're going. And I think that's the most likely model. We'll get some ripples, but I think that's the most likely model because the inherent structure is so concentrated at the top that you can't really run a serious uh, economic full employment program unless you had the political muscle, and they don't have the political muscle to do it. And, and there's another part to it, too. I, I think, you know, if you're sitting on a mound of cash, which a certain percentage of the population is, you know, the, whether it's 1, 5, or 10 percent, sometimes maybe a little more, but in terms of having investment capital it's of significance, it's probably less than 5 percent, and the big amounts are less than 1 percent. You know, it used to be you would look for places to invest in the conventional economy, uh, but that requires, as you were saying, some demand. There has to be a conventional economy worth investing in and nothing, no better alternative. Now there's such a speculative world to invest in. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think you know, the, the size of the derivatives markets, are, if I understand it correctly, are something like three times the glo global GDP. You can just gamble with your money. And that's and, what they're doing. And it's a higher return. So you'd actually, in some ways you don't give a damn what's happening in the rest of the economy. Well, that's at the very top, that's what's going on. It's a, it's a gambling casino, and that, that is true. Uh, they used to be, this is the other piece of this is, there used to be a capacity, and many liberal economists still kind of wish this were true, that you could get the government to intervene and spend money, build bridges, build highways, housing, hospital, every, everything, which would stimulate the economy in Keynesian fashion. And I think that would, in fact, work if you could do it, at least to a certain extent. But the capacity of liberalism, and remember I worked in the House and Senate at one point for liberals, that's really over to do that. They don't have the strength to do that anymore. And it's not just the Tea Party. Uh, first labor unions used to be, and that's the muscle of the traditional liberal program, and we'd be better off with a liberal program. A lot of people are getting hurt, so I'm not one of those people say, and it's good that it's getting worse. Much better to have people helped out. But that depended on a very strong labor movement, 35%, 34% of the of the country was organized in 1950s. It's now down to 11% in unions, 6% in the private sector. So the muscle behind the old liberal program 
It just isn't there to make to push a Keynesian solution or a big stimulus program. It just isn't there, which is another reason why stagnation is there. The government is, is substantially larger. It's not likely to go all the way down. On the other hand, you can't get it up. It's a very decaying. One of the things it does is it teaches people that something's really wrong. It kind of wakes people up to there. This is this is something's going on here that doesn't work right for a lot of people. I mean, there might be something cyclical here, which is you could have cyclical events like the 2008 crash. That's right. So, in other words, a crash, you know, a quasi stabilization, a floor, a little ripple, yep. and then another crash. But I would think every time that happens, it's going to be a little bit worse. There's going to be less ability for the Fed just to throw money at banks and try to stabilize things. You know, each time that decay is going to be in, you know, instead of the official seven to nine percent unemployment, we could be getting not very far away, where thirteen to fifteen percent unemployment starts to be kind of kind of a norm. Although many people think it already is. Well, the, uh, right now I think it is closer to fifteen percent if you really measure all the people who dropped out of the labor force. So stagnation, decay within and cycles within is probably right. How high they'll go, how deep they go, that we we don't know enough about that yet. But it's and, and what, what do you think are the political ramifications of, of a decade or two or more of this kind of economy? That's the central and very important point. Because in some ways, the whole liberal movement, which was able to do progressive programs in the New Deal, the Great Depression, and the post-war boom, in some ways, that was a total aberration. Really hard to think about it. But, and what it depended on was a massive global collapse and the fact that there was a Republican in office to take the blame, Hoover, could have been a Democrat, then the Republicans would have taken it. And we got one boost of legislation, mainly dependent on this crash, global. And then World War II, destroying all of our competitors and the post-war boom, cash saving, so forth, very unusual. And those are the heart contexts in which the great liberal programs and the labor unions were only 11% in 1929. And, and add to that, uh a Soviet Union that, whether it was or not in reality, is a, is a separate question, but is, in terms of global perception, was this workers' economy that had full employment and right. such and such, and, and American and Western capitalism going to say, no, no, we can give you full employment, we can right. do all this. So right. there was a kind of pressure to have some of these programs, especially That's in true. Europe. That's true. That's true. But these contexts... Which really isn't here anymore. And it's gone. The context was extremely unusual, if you think back on it. A worldwide depression and a worldwide war giving rise in the United States to prosperity. We weren't bombed. Europe was bombed. And the American working people, the unions, it was a boom period of the post-war period. That's when you got all your progressive legislation. With strong, and that's declined. That's gone. We've got competitors everywhere. We haven't got any labor unions of any great strength anymore. So the whole formation to, pro to produce a liberal solution, which might have helped, I I'm not against that. It would be good to help a lot of people in pain. That's just not available, which means the context we're entering, in my view, and, and what I write about in the book, is a decaying context, but not a collapse. And that's a place where people have time to learn and build and begin to develop alternatives. A collapse is very, very difficult to organize in. You might or might not win, but in, in decay, people learn and are open they, to new ideas. That's what we're finding on the ground all over the country in some of the work we've been doing. Uh, very interesting. They know something's wrong, and yet this is not a collapse. So what do we do tomorrow? How do we build? That, I think, is a very important way of understanding the, the next couple decades. So there's kind of two parts to this. Uh, there's how does one get some kind of political power, political formation, to implement a, policies that lead to a new economy? But I think it's very difficult to get to that kind of politics unless there actually is a vision that's fairly worked out about what this new economy might look like. I, th it's, I think it's very hard for ordinary people to buy in, uh, to vote for something or fight for something, which is just some slogans. Absolutely. So, I mean, so you know, there's a few people around, and you're one of them, and, and the group you're working with that have been trying to put some meat on the bones of what what a new economy look like, both in terms of the economics and the, and the democratic politics of right. that. So let's kind of start with the outlines. Well, it's, a, it's, it's even more profound than that from where I sit. We, we need to do something that makes sense, because there's a lot of people who try to do progressive things, and it doesn't make sense what they're trying to do. So you need to think it through to have integrity to the vision. 
you know, starting with yourself. So, um, and also, it's not just about a vision that's necessary, but one step down from a vision. Vision's about values, equality, liberty, community, ecological sustainability. What are the institutions that make up a system that would actually produce those values. And let me just add one thing. When I say vision, I, I don't have a technical version of yeah. what vision means, because for me, when it's a vision, it's all of, it's yeah. what, how would you implement it? But I think it's very important that it's not some utopian thing that someday Absolutely. in the future we will have this model society. It's yeah. like if you took over your city tomorrow right. or your state tomorrow, what does that actually look like? And, and, and in terms of knowing, for example, the kind of reforms you might want to implement, yes, there's going to be a lot of people fighting against you. I mean, you can look in, at, at Latin America where various governments are trying this in one form or another. It's a war. It's a class war. Yep. Now, I think that's, that's critical. What is interesting, if you begin to understand the context of an emerging long-term context of decay in which you're operating for, there are on the ground in the United States today, there are literally hundreds of examples that begin to point towards the new society, practical things. And people are doing it across the country, but the press does not cover what's going on. In one form or another, there are 10,000 worker-owned companies in the United States on the ground. Some good, some bad, some better, but they show you what you can do. And we're, we've been working with some very interesting advanced models in cities like Cleveland, where the, the largest, and they're large, they're not little companies. So you, if you want to do changing who gets to own wealth, and who owns wealth is the heart of any system, whether it's feudal system, it was land, or capitalist system, the corporations, or some of the state socialism of, of the Soviet Union, the state. Is there a way to own capital in a way that's much more democratic and builds a different model? Worker ownership is part of it, and you can find it in America today, many parts of the country, the press isn't, and it's very vibrant. Co-ops are part of this. If you want to talk about electricity, for instance, cities, publicly owned, utilities, public companies, are common in the United States. There are 2,000 of them. 20%, 25% of American electricity is co-ops and city-owned governments. And, and if you go back to what Mark said, and on the real news, we actually do reference Mark Swan on it once in a while. It doesn't happen on much media in the United States. Um, he, he said socialism is born in the womb of capitalism. Yeah. And, and you, these, are, these are, and I think the right wing is quite correct when they attack things like public ownership and say this is socialism. It's not yet socialism, but it is an embryo, the beginnings of such things. Yeah, it's, 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 and even more, it, it begins to be a very community-based democratic form where people participate directly. The land trusts, for instance, who owns the land in the neighborhood? Many, many cities now, it used to be, this used to be a very radical idea. Draw a circle around land in an urban area. Set up a nonprofit corporation or a city corporation. Take over the land to prevent gentrification. That used to be crazy. There are hundreds of them around the country now, and they are another form of changing who gets to own the wealth that begins to point a new direction. So what's exciting about this, and, and one of the really interesting things about the New Deal, is if you look on the ground, all of the experiments in the two decades before the New Deal were kind of the principles that later could be applied nationally. So I see this development, and, and the press doesn't cover much of it, but I'll give you a website, community-wealth.org, put the dash in, covers kind of what's going on. In my book, What Then Must We Do, we, we summarize it. But just beneath the surface, if you wanted, 25 years ago when I was working on this, or 30 years ago, you want to set up a worker-owned company, nobody had to call, no expert. Now, if you want to do it, there are hundreds of people who can help you. You want to do a land trust, you want to do city ownership, you can do that. You want to do state ownership. That's also 27 states invest directly in owning companies. Okay, well, in the next segment of our interview. I think um, Gar really kind of lays out the situation that we're in right now, where we're not going to have the recovery. We're not going to have the types of programs that we had before, but there really is something new that we can do. And so, next, I'd like to invite. Jackie, I'm going to share with you my passion, something that got me out of bed at 4 o'clock in the morning before I went to work to write a book. And my passion was fueled by stories of ordinary people like you and me coming together in small groups like this here in Baltimore tonight, working out together what were their problems, are their problems, what the solutions could be. And very simply, they rethought money. 
because if you don't have money, we ain't going very far. The question <coughs> that I ask myself and my co-author and many, many wonderful people I've had the opportunity to speak is, to is why are we poor? And there yeah. is a story I want to share with you tonight that comes from Brazil. And I think it is one of the most eloquent stories that uh, actually explains what can be done and how the issue of poverty within a community can be erased. Next slide, please. So we're going to Brazil, and we're going to this town called Fortaleza uh, on the northeast part of Brazil. Next slide. And this is what Fortaleza looks like today. It looks like Miami. Uh, lots of hotels, lots of nice fancy restaurants, etc. But 15 years ago, it was basically beach with <coughs> sailors, with fishermen, very simple, very simple society. And the government, the local government decided, hey, we want to exploit this area, bring in the tourist uh, dollar, and uh, build this whole area. So in order to do that, they quite literally had to take two or three communities, uplift them, and bring them to another part of Brazil where there was absolutely nothing. Next slide, please. And here we can see where they landed. Basically, not much. Uh, you can see very, very simple homes. There was not much in terms of roads, few shops, certainly not much in terms of employment, um, very basic uh, health care, and very basic schooling. Next slide. There we go. And here they are, you know, working and you know trying to bring this community together to try and put some shape on it, as it were, to get something going here. And next slide, please. So there was a meeting held, and there was about maybe there's about 30. 500 people in this, you know, in this community, and they had a big meeting like here on the Friday night and said, why are we poor? Why are we living like this? How come we have, this is our existence? Surely there's something better for us than this. And they said, the reason why we're poor is because we don't have money. Some genius in the audience came up with that one. <laughs> so they said, but we do have money. You know, we earn money. It may not be much, but we do earn money. What is happening? Next slide, please. So they all went, they decided that they'd all go home, and for the next week, they'd count up their money and do a tally of the money that was actually in the community itself. And they worked out that on an annual basis, they had 1.3 Brazilian reals, which is roughly 600,000 US dollars. And they said, it may not be a great deal of money, but it still is money, what's going on? And what they realized was that 80% of this national money was actually leaving their community. It was going to other parts of Brazil. And they said, what can we do to possibly stem this um, evacuation of money from our community? How do we get vigor into our community? What they decided to do was to create their own currency. So they created this currency called the Palmas, because there was nothing around but palm trees. If we look at the next uh, slide. And they started this campaign of buy from your neighborhood. So um, this currency, Palmas, worked in conjunction with the national money. Next slide, please. Ah, oh, we got a blank, and let's go to the next slide. Ah, here it is. And they opened up what they called Banco de Palmas, whereby you could get two types of loans. They had one called a um, consumption loan, which would be a small loan that would get you to the end of the month. For example, um, I have four children, and I campaign my gas bill my electricity bill. So no normal bank would lend me the $30 or the $50 in order to get through to the end of the month. But what would happen is we would go down to Banco Palmas and my good friend Margaret would come with me 
and I would tell the loan agent that I needed 30, uh, 30 palmas in order to get through to the end of the month. And Margaret would vouch for me. She said, you know, Jackie is part of our community. She's a hardworking woman. And I believe that she will keep her word to repay this loan. So I would be given this loan of 30 palmas and I could then go out and spend it within the community. So next slide, we will see that these consumption loans had no interest. And when we talk more about this over the weekend, you know, on the functional dynamics of money, what interest does on our money, we all can't imagine not having to pay interest on a loan. But our money is created completely out of debt it's based on nothing, there's nothing backing it. And interest has the function of concentrating the wealth to the top percentile of society. You can take all the money in the world and give it over to another percentile, uh, the, un, you know, the unbanked, the, the poor of the world. And over time, if you have interest, that section of the community will own all the money because it's just the money keeps on accumulating to those who have. So it was very, very important in the design of this currency that it would bear no interest whatsoever, but there'd be a 1% uh, fee just to handle administration. This money could not be converted into national money. So by not, it not being convertible, it stayed within the community. So I would go to businesses that would accept my palmas, for example, in payment for goods and services. And within that community, there were about 240 businesses that accepted palmas, offering discounts between 2 and 15% in order to incentivize people to come and spend their palmas. The second type of loan is the more conventional loan, if you can see the next slide, which was made in national money with a very, very low interest rate and this was like $5,000, $10,000 in, uh, in US money in order to start businesses. And all you would need is a very, very simple business plan. I want to open up a shop. There's a need for my, my type of, of goods and services that I produce. I may want to set up a dressmaking company. I may want to set up a farm and uh, you know, uh, provide milk and, and meat to my community. Very, very simple. And these kind of loans would be made. If we look to the next slide, this went, this went like fantastically. People were so excited. People started making their own businesses. People started getting employed. Uh, schools opened up. This was so exciting. And the real economy of this small town of Fortaleza started developing. Buildings were built, roads were built. Uh, people started taking pride in the fact that they could be business owners. And Joaquin de Melo was actually the individual that actually set up this currency of Palmas and Banco Palmas. And lo and behold, one day, they're about doing their business, and the Federales came in, took them away in handcuffs for money laundering. End of story. Unfortunately, this is before Instagram and uh, other... Uh, smartphones, etc. We don't have pictures of them being taken away in handcuffs, but I tell you, they were thrown into jail. And what then happened was, for years and years, there, there was this very contentious lawsuit between the, uh, that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Brazil, between the Central Bank of Brazil and the small community bank of Banco de Palmas. So you can imagine, on the last day at the Supreme Court, it was very, very tense. You obviously had all the suits, you had all the bankers on one side, and you had the People's Bank of Banco Palmas uh, on the other, waiting to hear what would be the verdict of the Supreme Court of the land. When the decision was rendered, the judge in charge turned to the central bankers and said, gentlemen, what have you done for the poor? There was complete silence in the room. And with that, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Banco Palmas, 
that they were not money laundering, they were doing good for their communities, they were lifting people out of poverty. And, next slide please, what we have now 15 years later is this is an example of literacy, literacy school, economic and financial literacy schools where women and uh, the people of the community come together and they discuss uh, the function of interest, why it's important not to have interest on loans, they learn how to save, they learn how to budget. These are the kinds of gatherings that these people have. Next slide. <coughs> this is actually in the Central Bank of Brazil at the moment. These, this is a theater group that is dancing and singing about financial literacy and getting everybody excited to learn how money really works. In the next slide, these are some examples of small businesses in the town of Fortaleza. Next slide, please. We have some more, yeah, sorry, one back, please. Okay, there you see more examples. What is really fascinating is that after 15 years, there are now 173 banks like Banco Palmas all over Brazil, and they have a plan to move to 1,000 such banks. Each community has their own currency, usually named after an animal or a flower that is typical in the area, and they provide loans for businesses, and they do these what I call consumption loans so that working families can make it to the end of the month or the end of the year. Uh, in the next slide, this is Joaquin himself, 15 years old later and obviously getting grayer. And you can see here they have a uh, smart card. And that is a smart card for the currency that is in a poor district of Rio de Janeiro. And it's, um, I'm trying to remember in a moment what it's called, Mombucos. So this is, a, uh, this is a card where this lady's Mombucos is actually uh, put onto her card and she can spend it within the community. The story of Banco Palmas is one of 6,000, 10,000 community stories all around the world of what ordinary people can do when they come together and simply rethink money by linking their unused resources, which is usually the, the community's talent, their labor, their time, their ingenuity, with their unmet needs. And I, you, don't need, you don't need me to go through the litany of unmet needs we have in our communities. There are children to be taught, there are elders to be looked after, um, there's roads to be built, there's you know, endless, endless amounts of community needs. And what is more fantastic about these local community currencies is that the people themselves, they come together. And who better to come up with a solution for their own community than the people that are dealing with the issues there and then. So this is one example of Brazil. And over the course of the next day, I look forward to exploring other examples from all around the world and here in the United States of what communities are doing what fantastic things ordinary people are doing that are totally extraordinary, simply by rethinking money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And that's a perfect lead into our last speaker, Michael Coleman, who's a leader with United Workers, who can talk about what the people in the city of Baltimore are doing. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. As um, I was introduced, I am Michael Coleman, just in case people kind of confused about that. <laughs> <laughs> I am a leader and organizer with the United Workers, a human rights organization that's led by the poor to end poverty. Pause. How are we going to end poverty? How exactly do we plan to do that? I hear this question all the time. Um, well, before I get into that, this vision began, for me anyway, with the realization that human rights are connected and intertwined all across the board. Healthcare, education, um, your trash being picked up when it needs to be picked up, 
all of this is connected. So while we speak of housing, we speak of these issues with all the other issues in mind. This helps us to be fluid in our organizing. We always keep in mind the big picture. We find too often that we get stuck in these issue silos where I'm focused on healthcare, you may be focused on education, and we lose focus of the big picture. We lose sight of it. And, and that is a hindrance. That's a problem. It actually slows us down. So the more mindful we are of the big picture, the better we can fight the issues that we're actually fighting. So one of the big problems we have is a focus not on people and human priorities, but on whether or not a certain column of the ledger is profitable and whether or not a certain big business stakeholders are satisfied. So while developments like the Inner Harbor, uh, Harbor East get billions and millions of dollars in subsidies, neighborhoods face cuts to basic services from recreation centers to firehouses. Yes, firehouses. Baltimore actually closed several firehouses within the city. And this is going to be a, a very dangerous summer. Um, so the harbor offers, while the harbor, the harbor offers a place to play for tourists, it provides largely only temporary poverty wage jobs. Our mayor, Stephanie Williams Blake, will have us believe that the private sector or the, the, pop, the private market is going to bail us out of these problems. This is a hole that has been dug by our city officials for years. It's going to take a while for us to get out of it. But the idea that the market solution or the market is going to get us out of it is a false hope. So it's not going to resolve the issue of the divide between the rich and the poor. There's no way for that to happen. For Maryland and Baltimore to lead on issues of inequality, it will require a new fair development agenda that prioritizes. I feel like I sound like Darth Vader. <laughs> Luke. <laughs> but we want to prioritize human dignity and stripping public, public resources. We call that type of development fair development. This is where United Workers and our organizing comes in. There's a growing push for development that meets basic needs. Rather than contribute to inequality, this development shares benefits through strengthening public goods and importantly, the process for developing these public goods, such as housing, jobs, sustainable environment, is participatory, transparent, and is accountable. Now, how do we come up with this idea of fair development? Well, let me give you a little bit of history about the United Workers. United Workers began in 2002 in a, a homeless shelter. It was a firehouse turned homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. and the members there were actually living there, you know, and they studied, they reflected on how we come to this, this period. They reflected on how they became homeless in the first place. The irony is they were actually employed. A lot of them in some of the prestigious um, projects that Baltimore were doing at the time, the Inner Harbor, uh, Camby Yards where the Orioles play, um, and et cetera. So we see, oftentimes we see homeless people as stereotypes, lazy, drug addicted, mentally ill, and we see them as part of a problem, not the solution. But even the fact that they met, that they came up with these ideas, proves they're wrong. In fact, they were all working, as I said earlier, at a lot of these projects that Baltimore you know, had going on. I forgot to mention a right, uh, big important one, John Hopkins. <laughs> I don't want to leave him out. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys and, and ladies were living proof of failed development. A trickle down, it's trickle down economics where the city has given away its wealth, its workers, its land to the wealthiest developers. 
in the hopes that prosperity will eventually trickle down to the rest of us. You can look around Baltimore and see that trickle down system. <laughs> is it going to work? It hasn't worked, um, and it's not going to work. The failure is so profound and so twisted up in our culture that most of us believe that we are to blame for this failure. Well, when I came to the United Workers, I didn't see myself as an intellectual or a highly important figure. But through the organization, I realized that I am actually very important. My voice is very significant. And I use my voice to speak up, not just, not just to speak up for people, but to help people speak up for themselves. You know, we believe in transforma transformality. We don't want to just be transactional. You know, something happens and then we push back. Oftentimes we, we fight in a defensive way. It's time for us to be more um, proactive. Kind of went off my script a little bit. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. I gotta be careful that we end up talking about the Spurs or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like I was, how can I explain? I, I didn't feel like um, I was a, a, a significant part or important part of my society. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you why in a little bit. But um, I didn't have certificates, I didn't have degrees. Um, society puts a lot of value on these things, as we all know. Um, if you're a person that doesn't have these things, you're considered to be someone that can't do a job. You're, 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 you're considered um, not worth a lot in our society, which is why I felt that way. Though I could do the job of someone that could, that, you know, that have these degrees, diplomas, and all these accolades that society put all this emphasis into. Um, I actually think I have a lot of potential. Um, and through my youth, let me back up a little bit. I spent eight years in prison, just to put things in perspective so people understand um, why I feel the way I do today. Now, eight years ago, I, um, my parents, my dad wasn't around, my mom was on drugs, and I am the oldest of all of my siblings. I felt that I had the responsibility to put food on the table when my parents couldn't. I felt like I had the responsibility to make sure my sister, who was the youngest at the time, well, she's the youngest, um, mm -hmm. could go to school with the things she needed. So I, w I became the provider by default. And that took me out of school. That, puts me, that put me in the streets. Never did I have the intention of being out there. Never did I have the intention of breaking law or doing wrong. But this is what I had to do. You know, I was in school at the time. I was getting the education. But when it came time for education or food, <laughs> I had to eat. My family had to eat. Things had to be done. You know, baby sister had a, a field trip that cost $12 and we couldn't even think of sending her. That's just crazy. $12. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, You may say that it was my fault. You may say that I threw away my opportunity. You may say that I could have done things differently. And I would agree that I could have done things differently. But at 17, you don't really think about anything other than what's necessary at the moment. My family needed to eat. I'm the oldest. I had to do something. So I, I did what I did and ended up in, in prison. Uh, so we have a society that sets up people like me. And I've seen that firsthand, you know, and not just myself. You may say it's my fault, but it's too many of me. It's not just 
Michael Coleman to have these issues. It's not just Michael Coleman that was forced. And I do feel like I was forced to do what I had to do to feed my family. We live in a system, as I said, that's it's, it's broken. Well, let me, no. The system isn't broken. The system is working exactly as it was designed to work. <laughs> it is highly efficient. We live, oh boy, we got our work cut out for us. We understand this. I'm proud to say I'm part of the United Workers who is full of dedicated people who is ready to, to withstand this, this, this long fight that we got ahead of us. We know this is just, it's not a short campaign. It's not gonna be two, three, four, five years. We know it's gonna take a long time. But we've dug in and we've prepared to prepare ourselves to fight for this, this, what we asked for, you know, which is freedom, equality, justice. Um, see, I've been all over the past and went off my script. <laughs> <laughs> so United Workers, we put a lot of emphasis on developing leaders. We'll, we consider ourselves an organization of leaders, not just members. There's a lot of organization that has members, you know, they focus a lot on membership numbers being high and well, we don't, we don't do that. We believe in leadership. We believe that in order to reach this promised land, the land of equality and justice and fairness, it has to be done through leaders. You know, I see everyone in this room, everyone in this building, everyone in this city as leaders and potential leaders. It's up to us to live up to that potential. It's up to us to decide to become a leader. So, and I apologize, I'm not as eloquent as these. I was just thinking that you're more eloquent <laughs> than I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I came to United Workers because of their, their, their focus on humanity, because of their morals, their principles, and the way they, United Workers actually have a plan, whereas a lot of organizations that I've heard of and some I've actually been a part of, didn't have a plan. So the normal became, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but no one is have a plan to stop the sky from falling. United Workers actually came up with that plan, and um, I believe wholeheartedly that it worked. That plan is called fair development. Wow, I didn't win. Whew. <laughs> so I came into the organization because I worked at Camden Yards. A year before, United Workers organized and was able to win the living wage. So the wages went from four, 450 to 1150 an hour. That significantly benefited me, you know. And um, I was talking to, I was coming from work one night and I met one of the organizers, Greg Rosenthal, and he began to talk to me. Of course, I'm tired. This is like three o'clock in the morning, I'm getting off, I'm like, I don't wanna hear it. But he continued to talk to me, and he, instead of attempting to organize me, he wanted to know more about me. And more importantly, share more about him. So it wasn't, oh, this is a great organization, um, you should join, and. Um, how was your wages? Did you like it? No, it was more like, what's going on with you, Mike? You know, the following day, Oreos lost that day, too. <laughs> but we talked about that, too. Like, he was very personable, very personable with me, and that made all the difference. I think part of organizing, a great part of organizing is um, sharing yourself and knowing who you're, who you're trying to organize, you know, and um, just relating to that person. That's, that's huge. That's huge. Um, I always believe that things could change if people work together. I always saw our landscape as being one where people didn't work together, even if it's for good. You know, I'm organizing for education, you're organizing for um, health care, and that was just it. We're going to stay on our own track. But we believe, United Workers, that in order to achieve our goals, we really have to work work together. We really need to break down these barriers that keep us separate and divided. 
You know, it's the old saying that the best way to, to conquer something is to divide it. You know, divide and conquer has been used throughout history. So if we take that weapon away, we can actually win this, this, this battle. We can actually win. Um, you know, okay, wait for that. <laughs> That's more of a distraction than help. But um, yeah, I, I come before you guys, not as an actual, not as an actual, maybe I should go back to it, huh? <laughs> but, um, not as an intellectual, but as a, a human, you know, as a young black man that lives in society. Um, I relate a lot to what this young lady has said earlier, and I appreciate what you've said. And I feel like we have the power. We have the power collectively, you know, to change the way things are going right now. In fact, we have 90% of the power. They're shaking in their boots to know that we might organize. So when we go into this uh, conference tomorrow, we need to go with the idea of keeping the bigger picture in mind. If you don't leave, if you leave here with anything that I said, leave with the idea that everything is connected. We are each other. I am you. I am you. You are me. You are, you are her. We, we are each other. And together, we have a lot of power. So, I love that. I love your, your presentation. You know, um, what Br Brazil has done, we can do it here. But it means that we have to work together to make it happen. So, um, thank you and go Orioles. <laughs> <laughs> brings us back around. You know, we, um, we have the opportunity now. We're in a crisis. We need to do something. There are a lot of models out there. We can look at those models, and that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow. But then we need to decide collectively what are the values that we want to incorporate in, in these new institutions that we create. What kind of a city do we want to have um, in, here in Baltimore that reflects the people here? And it's up to us to use these, this information that we'll get tomorrow at the conference and, and continuing on um, to really transform our city. And, and it's happening in other places too. I know some of our speakers were down at the Jackson Rising Conference um, in Mrs. Jackson, Mississippi just last weekend. So this is, this is an exciting time where it's bubbling up. So let's open it up. Uh, how much time do we have? No okay, do you want, can we bring the floor mic to the middle? Why don't we... Um, open this up for discussion and we'll just maybe to make it easy have people line up if you can if you can't i think don't be shy now is that going to be there we go good i'm not going to stop making noise um, anybody have a, a question or a comment and um, we do everybody probably picked up a, a program if you're not coming to the conference tomorrow we'll ask you to give the program back but it gives an outline of kind of the things that we'll be discussing tomorrow and who the speakers are and their um, bios of each of the speakers in here as well so it's great hi uh, this question is more directed to Jackie I would say uh, so there are a lot of models that have come out uh, around the world of people rethinking uh, how to interact with one another through this tool that we know is money. Uh, there's a, been a lot of attention, particularly here in the West, around Bitcoin as, you know, this technological innovation that, you know, transcends the boundaries of the normal money system. And there are many out there who think that it's uh, a, a panacea to our economic woes. My question is, you know, how do the kinds of currencies that you're speaking about differ from Bitcoin? And are there models out there in the world that you see as being particularly useful in addressing inequality? How many people know about Bitcoin? Okay. 
One of the most important things when dealing within a community, when they come together to design their own currency, is number one, there is transparency. Meaning, you know who everybody involved is. There's no, no behind any masks. And one of the things about Bitcoin, nobody knows the person who's supposed to have designed it. So that's a scary thing. Number two is there has to be open accounting. And there has to also be a way to deal with conflict. And one, in all the different uh, models that I've looked at throughout the world, the issue of conflict resolution is something that everybody shies away from because, you know, guys, when you get together, no matter whether you're dealing with energy, with um, education, whatever the core issues you're dealing with, and particularly around money because of how it's, you know, hot wired into our psyches, there are going to be issues because you're going to have to talk to your neighbor. You are going to have to talk to people that you don't really like talking to, and issues are going to come up and people are going to fall apart. So one of the most critical things that we need to do when in formalizing a new currency is that the community comes together and finds a way of how they would, in hyper-democracy, deal with issues and be transparent. Bitcoin is ingenious uh, in its design, but it is a tool for speculation. It's a tool for investment. It is not an honest-to-God community currency that will invigorate a local uh, community. And I need to go into about 15 minutes of explanation on that, which we, we can do over a glass of wine a little bit later. But one of the great things that Bitcoin has shown is that it is possible to be in um, Baltimore and do trade and commerce in uh, Belgrade, in Budapest, in, in Belgium, wherever. The focus I would suggest for you is you do not need a new global currency. What you need is a local currency where the money is kept here within the community and invigorates the commerce of this particular city. And you can address the issues such as healthcare, such as education, um, how to deal with the elderly with a local currency. There is a place for Bitcoin, there is a place for the US dollar, there's a place for the Euro, and there's a place for the 16,000 or so uh, local community currencies, and for the emerging uh, dozen or so of uh, commercial currencies that help businesses uh, within, within regions. So um, it's, uh, the great thing about Bitcoin, it's got the conversation out into the open but we need to be rig rigorous when we come together to design a currency for Baltimore or wherever we're going to design the currency for. I hope that sort of answers your question. <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Um, Diane, I want to ask you the question, how do we start, what needs to happen for us to start that conversation about the privilege where people would talk open and honest I think those conversations are beginning to happen now. Mm -hmm. oh. mm. Do we need to turn that mic off when we're... Yes, that's that mic is still on. Okay. I can't get up and do it. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. I, I yeah. think those conversations are beginning to happen now. I think those conversations can happen right here. I think that it clearly has to happen, though I would tell you, to be successful with people that have training. Um, there's members, I know at least one still in the room of Baltimore Racial Justice, Avis, uh, is back there. Um, there are a number of organizations here that will do those conversations and help you do that. I can tell you whether it's a community conversation, whether it's organization conversation, there's a group now in Baltimore, there's work that OSI, there's work that we're doing, there's work that Baltimore Community Foundation. There is a work that Baltimore Community Foundation is now doing with neighborhoods to begin this conversation. I think it is now the time to begin that conversation in such a way that it's put on the table where it's not about an interpersonal, but about how it impacts all of us collectively in all of those negative ways in terms of particularly the relationship 
to the economy. But I would ask Avis to raise her hand again in terms of the Baltimore Racial Justice Act. That's part of a leadership in this area that have a number of years they've been in this space in terms of doing leading this conversation. Actually, Baltimore Racial Action is a part of the partner for us as well as doing some auditing. They have done agency audits, organizational audits around this issue. That's critical to do that in such a way that people are clear and comfortable about hearing this conversation and have tools to take it to the next level. Because this isn't an interpersonal, this isn't a shouting match about race. This is around how do we change that and recognize those <laughs> systemic and structural barriers limit all of us. Testing. Okay. Thank you, Diane. I am from Baltimore Racial Justice Action. We are a group of people who have been around for about 10 years as an organization, but many of us work in anti-oppression training and uh, auditing and uh, workshops and so forth for a long time before we started Baltimore Racial Justice Action. But I have a question for you because I know that Associated Black Charities is working in a program called More in the Middle. My understanding of that concept is that because the opportunity for building the economy, the local economy, rests with those who are in the middle, it makes sense to put resources uh, in place to bolster the middle class. Mm -hmm. So my question for you, because I'm really curious about the role for the larger commercial institutions in this economy that are so vested in the way things are. What is the role? How do they, are they, can they transform? How do they become an ally in uh, transforming the local economy by adding to the middle class, which in Baltimore are largely people of color? Right. And have they gotten on board with that? Some have. I think it's similar to even the for-profit world, but I think in many cases, the large institutions in this city represent the nonprofits, including Hopkins. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people begin to recognize where they can't physically move their institution, that they're landlocked and they're here, that their economic fate, their fate in terms of whether it's crime, whether it's about not having a quality of opportunity for their workers, that their future lies in those negative aspects. And so I think they're becoming clear the importance of using themselves as a way to change some of these. It's not without um, I would tell you it requires leadership. It requires a visionary leader. It requires a leader willing to risk. I would not tell you all the institutions are willing to do that. I would tell you I've probably had conversations with most of them here in this city. I would tell you that some are ready to step up and press for the hard conversation, and others are not. But I think it, again, is going to take all of us. I think it's back, I would say, to Michael's point, which is very poignant to me, around the silos that it really is not the silos. It really is that we really all have got to understand this is a common agenda, that if we don't change that, that those of us who think we're not impacted, we're very much impacted by that. And I think that is what begins to change the institutions willing to come to the table. Peace and love, family. My name is Shaka Zulu. I come to you with peace and love from the Black Panther Party of DC and other advocates of that. I'm also with the Real News as well as uh, Word on the Street, Street Sense, and other newspapers, <coughs> I mean, throughout, not only this country, but abound, you know what I mean, as well as Canada and Europe and Africa and right now in Somalia. We're talking about the same aspects where we're trying to change lives and our impact which affects families that were downtrodden before and try to bring them up. And I think this whole course of economics says that not only these are impacting people, but when we talk about words like reentry, I haven't heard that today. You know what I mean? And when I talk about re-injury, 
You're talking about 65% of your total population of Baltimore that are coming back and trying to get a job as opposed to taking care of family and family values. And we're talking about how that impacts the children within to create, you know, a closing to a cycle of negativity and positivity. When we talk about homeland security, we're not talking about how to build co-ops, how to do land trust mm -hmm. and give back to the people of. We ain't talking about farming within, but yet we also know economically it makes money for the people within those parameters. Because quite frankly, I realized, because I tested it myself, $187 for a single black male who is a disabled veteran cannot afford to live mm -hmm. on any month Lee County. I'm talking about 28 days, 31 days. There's no calendar in which we can put in that parameter to take care of all your needs. And quite frankly, in Baltimore, you need a car. So we're talking about insurance and taking care of our children. When we talk about a co-op society, and I talk about not only Glut, but I talk about Tacoma Park and other areas in Maryland as well as in D.C. They say that we even do a farmer's market for individuals who can't afford to live on a daily basis today. I'm not talking about tomorrow, I'm talking about right now. This is what our economic summit is all about. And this is why the people are here. If they're not here for that, I don't know what you're here for, but I hope you hear something that'll take you back to your community and understand what we're really talking about here. It's not politics. It's about how the people are coming together because my advocacy is for, <laughs> what, homeless veterans. Mm -hmm. And when I searched for them, I found homeless citizens mm -hmm. within a community that has 46,000 vacancies. Mm -hmm. But yet we're building skyscrapers mm -hmm. and actually doing something across the street that is enhancing what? nothing for the people but our personal people and that's they're doing tunco with teeth cleaning for a building and not for people that have to live and eat every day now we talk about universal stuff and now y'all are talking about how to bring this about for people that really need it now, I can give up myself, which I have already done. I'm a disabled veteran myself. And I'm fighting a war still right here on these. <coughs> I call this a plantation because until we take it over, it's still a plantation. This is for the public and for the people that are saying that we need help. And what you are talking about is going to enhance lives. We're talking about public farming. We're talking about public people giving their own enhancement to their lives and not a handout. And quite frankly, there's no quite frankly anything called a handout called government institutionalizing of, what is it, $187 per month for an individual with no children. I don't know anybody can survive on that. Do you know anybody? Okay, TDAP is another $200. That's $387 per month for one individual to live. And we know a better way to do that because we can incorporate other companies to come in and say, look, here, we have money for you, and we can get outside stuff 
and you're not ready to do that, but you want to bring in a casino, and this is not my general vote for, and I know it's not the people's vote for, so therefore the casinos are coming in, but yet we got nothing back for it. Here, I'm on Upper North. I live right here in the city, North Avenue, and we're saying love to everyone else. It's in our district, but yet you want to build up a corporate, meaning my taxes, but you're not giving back anything for the children of the people that live there already. Peace and love. Thank you. answer that gentleman one of the most interesting things that politicians do particularly around election time is that oh we've got to bring in these big box stores from other parts of the country and or a big factory and that will create employment in our particular town or area and what I say rather than trying to create 5,000 new jobs by bringing in a factory that may disappear in three or five years time because of the tax breaks run out or whatever else why don't you take 5,000 local businesses and empower them to create one extra job. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, those businesses will be around decades and another decade to come. Uh, Hi. Uh, my name is Ian Schlackman, and uh, I've been in Baltimore for quite a while. And I've worked with the uh, Baltimore B-Note. We have a local currency here, the Baltimore B-Note. Uh, I've worked with a small group that uh, tried to start a Baltimore time bank. Um, I've worked with the a lot of different projects in Baltimore that are around the alternative economy, yeah. new economy planning, that kind of thing. And uh, one thing I've really noticed and I've really been upset about is the lack of capital that have come into these projects. They're often never taken seriously, ever taken seriously. And uh, the other thing is uh, lack of awareness. You know, when you have three or four people doing this in their part time out of their house, there's only so many people they could reach in a day. Um, and the city has no interest in promoting this stuff, neither does the state. It's very, very difficult to get any kind of bills passed. So a uh, question to the panel is kind of, what do you think is hurting us most in terms of getting these issues out there, making people aware, and making them demand more from their government? I think, God. <laughs> <laughs> I think, here in Baltimore and actually across the country, that one of the biggest problems we have is hopelessness. When hopeless, when there's no hope present, it doesn't matter what you're trying to say, you know? So if you can instill hope in, you know, the people, the residents here, then you can actually move forward with, you know, your project. Um, and I can speak to that personally, because being organized at, you know, the stadium, I didn't have hope. It was just like, this is what it is. Look, I'm an ex felon I've got to deal with this and just kind of grind it out. But the best thing United Worker has given me is hope. You know, the empowerment to say, um, your voice does matter. You know, you do have a seat up, at a pan up on this panel. So, you know, when you instill hope, you, the possibilities are endless. They're dancing in the streets, and they were educating the local community on how to save, uh, you know, about uh, how to take credit and how to use it responsibly. We lack education in this country about basic economics and basic money. And I hate to break it to you, but America is behind the rest of the world when it comes to other monetary innovations. Mm -hmm. And this is so. I'm hoping that uh, with communities like Baltimore and others coming together with sharing of more resources, and you do need some hard currency in order to sustain the workers who are setting up these projects. But I do think we can learn from our mistakes, and we're like the early days of aviation. It's a miracle these things fly, but someday we will have a 777 flying. I would add that it's also about trust. The conversation Michael made about hope in terms of trust, in terms of there's no way that you can be in this city and not understand how much race divides us. There's no way in Baltimore you could ever, it's palatable, you can feel it. We don't talk about it. In terms of communities of color, 
in terms of the difference. I don't trust you in terms of, and it's not just from a standpoint of low income. I will tell you there's a whole different conversation in communities of color, whether it's middle income or not. I will tell you what it feels like in terms of for somebody, <clears throat> young men, certainly I can't tell you how Michael felt. I have a grandson that was murdered in this town. I can tell you in terms of that. So the question is, I think Michael's point is so valid on a very interpersonal way. Until we're willing to really have honest conversations, it's not going to change. Because I don't believe you, if I'm a community member, that it's really about something different. Because I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it. And we've created the communities that we have right now. William Julius Wilson talks about the whole under. We've created these communities. We've created by the policies of structural institutional races. We talk about World War II and the people that benefited from World War II were not people of color. So we created this system that we have here and we're not willing to figure out how to uncreate that unless we struggle with this issue. And Baltimore, until it struggles with that issue, it is never gonna be any different. How many more people? I think there's a young woman. Wait. <laughs> so how many more people wanted to ask a question? Because I we I think we're on pretty much. Do we have how many? Four or five minutes. Four or five minutes. So let's try it. So we have two, three, four people with questions. Five. Shabby, you already spoke. So we're gonna have a <laughs> we're gonna have a reception afterwards where we can continue the conversation. So let's just um, kind of try to do this. I'll, I'll try and make it quick and then yeah. somebody else can jump so in. So we can have the last three, four. Um, actually, uh, kind of snowballing off of what you had said and kind of addressing the second question from the lady in, in uh, Maroon, um, is that, uh, you know, I, I really do believe that, that these issues still stem from issues of uh, racial discrimination and income discrimination are still very interpersonal. And um, in my personal experience, uh, I grew up in an all-white community. So I had no idea what kind of lives were suffering. Um, it is so critical to be self-reflective and, and ask yourself, you know, how am I contributing to this problem? How am I alleviating it? Um, and for me personally, I have found that actually the, the transaction of money is one of the most powerful ways of bonding with someone that you know nothing about. You know, going in and buying fruit at a fruit stand um, from a complete stranger, when my hand is on one side of the bill and his hand is on the other side of the bill, it doesn't matter how dark his skin looks against mine, what we're sharing is wealth really tangibly and we'll be sharing stories, we'll be talking, hopefully, starting conversations. So if there is anywhere that more and more of those stories can be shared and more and more of those interactions can happen, it's with local, local currency, 100%, because it's encouraging people from two blocks away to go and meet for the first time. So. Thank you. Why don't we um, go ahead and just take the, the questions and then see if we can have a short response from the panel to the, all of them. And then we'll break. I just had a quick question about reverse consumerism and how that uh, works into the concept that it's our economy is working in terms of helping people become um, owners of their own wealth. Uh, we, when we think about it, we're a consume, consume, consume economy. How can we get people to be a little bit more self-sufficient where they're making their own cleaning and hygiene products as opposed to purchasing it from these large companies where, you know, again, that money is leaving our community, so. Hi, my name is Bonnie Lane. I work in multiple capacities, currently campaign manager for Ian Schlockman for Congress. Two quick questions. What do you think of the idea of universal basic income as a means to alleviate poverty? And second, how do you break down the stereotype of economics? Because when I was in school, I was completely bored with economics. In the past few months, I found it very exciting. <laughs> Was there one more? If, if 
I think I would say we, we just we need different types of money. It's not just more money, it's different types of money. So it's working in parallel, complementing the national system. And we can get into that tomorrow. Yeah. Let's say one more, go ahead. Hi, my name is Andrea Calderon. I'm a paraeducator in Southwest Baltimore at Morrill Park Elementary Middle School. I also work at Red Emma's Coffee Shop Bookstore. Um, so um, I'm very familiar with what the situation is for students down there in that part of town. Um, it is, Morrill Park Elementary Middle is a turnaround school, so we have a really high rate of TFA, Teach for America teachers, and Baltimore Teachers Residency teachers um, who are learning how to teach in a lot of ways for the first time. Um, we, all, we are all in the process of learning, so it's, you know, it's an understanding that our administration has. Now, we have a very interesting community and cultural situation where um, it is very different from the rest of town. Um, Southwest, Baltimore, Morrill Park, Curtis Bay, Brooklyn, Violetville, a lot of communities that I work in are, um, have not traditionally been integrated parts of the city. Um, and have um, been white working class communities for a long time. Um, we have communities of color there and they're being forcefully integrated by the Latino community at this point and a very interesting small pocket of Vietnamese um, families. Um, and so having to deal with those racial tensions every day, my question is, um, I'm wondering how we can start transforming um, the administrative methods that we have in the city to deal with to kind of build language around race, gender, class, and um, different socioeconomic stereotypes so that as educators, we can continue to grow and be able to frame that language for our students that are having to deal with these concepts on an everyday basis. Great question. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um, did you want to respond? Well, yeah. I want to respond back to the question about consumer uh, reversing yeah, reverse that. Consumer. I, there's a number of studies out, particularly as it relates to the African American community. Much of that consumer behavior is related to how we feel about ourselves. Mm. In terms of, I don't remember the number now. In terms of the trillion dollars that African Americans spend versus the amount of wealth they have in terms of spend on consumerism. Part of the research in terms of both psychology is can you begin to shift how people view themselves and it will also begin to shift how they use their money. I think that's a part of the education piece, but it's very deeply rooted in how they view themselves and how they value or devalue. Right. And I think like um, with the Banco Palmas, where people realized that so much of their money was leaving the community, um, with the alternative currencies, the complementary currencies, they can only be as effective as there are goods and services produced in that local community. So if we can create an incentive type system where we're, we're building up more businesses locally that meet our needs, um, then we start to have less money leaving the community and I think we can start um, learning the value of just finding, of using the products that we need to use and that we can mostly produce here locally. I wanted to quickly respond to the kind of idea of a guaranteed national or guaranteed income. I think that's essential. Uh, because we're just never going to have the number of jobs that, uh, you know, to meet the need. Um, with technology, it's changed the whole situation. Um, but if instead of having corporate welfare, where we're giving so many millions of dollars to these, these corporations, if we have taxpayer investment, because these are our public dollars going to them, so instead, if we're building a green energy economy, we have taxpayer investment in that and there's a return to the taxpayers. Over time, we can start building up a guaranteed national income and we can get rid of poverty altogether that way. Um, and I wrote down what the other one was and I can't read my own writing, oh my gosh. Guaranteed national income and, oh, economics. You know, there's starting to be a little bit of a revolt in some of the economic schools because they're not being taught this new economy. And so I think that when you're being taught an economy that's actually about meeting people's needs and protecting the planet and reflecting the values, I think it becomes a whole lot more interesting at that point. And did you guys want to have, before we finish? Yeah. This has been delicious. Great. Thank you. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Let's continue the conversation.